Welcome back to the channel. How can your brain learn? Not metaphorically, but in the literal physical sense, how can billions of neurons, each firing spikes and passing chemicals across synaptic gaps, possibly construct knowledge? In previous videos, we explored how the neurons of the brain, organized as cortical columns, can naturally represent the nodes and relationships of a graph. But how can your brain actually learn? In a moment, I'll demonstrate the only mechanism that can work with my favorite example, Fido is a dog. It's a lot more interesting than you might expect. The demonstration I'm about to show built in Brain Simulator 3 shows the process directly, not as theory, but as necessity. Starting from nothing, the system experiences, differentiates, and abstracts until a network of understanding emerges. It's the only mechanism that could possibly work. If you think there's another way a brain could learn, propose it in the comments. Show how a collection of neurons could acquire knowledge without forming relationships among patterns. There is no shortcut, no hidden module, no learning center. There is only structure and change within that structure from which intelligence arises. The software functionality I'll show in this video isn't complete as yet, but I wanted to share it now while several open questions remain, which I'll touch on at the end of this video. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. Beyond AI, I've developed software for neurological test instruments and neural simulators. I created the Future AI Society to explore how neuroscience can inform smarter, more human-like AI. If you are interested in this type of content, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell because the YouTube algorithm won't surface videos like this unless you ask for them. Let's begin with an empty brain. A nearly blank information graph. Nothing is known, nothing has a name. Now imagine the first sensory experience. You see something with fur, a tail, and the ability to bark. We can use any set of sensations like visual fragments or phonemes, but I've chosen this set of attributes for a clearer explanation. The system searches its graph for a match and finds nothing because the graph is empty. To learn, it allocates a new node relating these sensory attributes. This new node is unlabeled. It represents a collection of observed characteristics, but there is no concept yet of dog or Fido, just a cluster of connected sensory impressions. Notice that the same inputs are used for both searching and learning. This is a key point. Brains don't have a specific learning mode with unique inputs. Information just pours into the brain, which does its best to make sense of it all. At some time later, you could be told, this is called FIDO. The system simply associates at label to the existing node. It's important to note that the association of words could have happened at any time before, during, or long after the observation, or even not at all. The label doesn't create the concept. It merely assigns a convenient handle for something the system already knows internally. And while we're at it, the concept of this, in this context, means the best result of the brain's most recent search. Think about that. It's shown in the graph display, highlighted in pink. Later, you observe that Fido is brown. When you encounter this new attribute, the system again searches for the node that best matches the current set of perceptions, fur, a tail, barks, and finds the Fido node. The match is not perfect, but is strong, so when directed, the system adds a new attribute, is brown, to the same node. The knowledge structure grows richer, but it still represents a single specific instance. Now a new observation occurs. 
you see something that shares many of the same attributes, fur, a tail, and barking, but this one is black. The system again searches for a matching node. The closest match is still Fido, since it's the only node with similar attributes. But when our internal observer says, no, this is different, that rejection triggers something fundamental. It tells the system that this new observation is not Fido, even though it shares many attributes. In response, the system creates a new node to represent the new set of attributes. But it also notices that several attributes are common between the two nodes, fur, tail, and barks. And it forms a new parent node to hold these common features. The shared attributes bubble up to this parent, leaving the distinguishing features is brown and is black at the individual level. We can now label the new node Rex by saying this is called Rex. To label the parent node, we need to perform a search with attributes which are unique to that node. So searching for just fur will highlight the parent node so we can say, this is called dog. The graph now contains a hierarchy. Dog has fur, a tail, and can bark. Fido is a dog and is brown. And Rex is a dog and is black. From here, important principles become visible. The brain can only access knowledge through attributes, through patterns of recognition. You can find dog by searching for barks and fur, and you can find Fido by adding brown to that search. Once your brain has added words like Fido, Rex, or dog, they also become attributes, and the brain can search on them as well. This crazy simple demonstration of how your brain might learn that Fido is a dog brings up a host of fascinating observations. Some are obvious, some hold a deeper philosophical understanding. First, searching and learning are two sides of the same coin. This is key to the brain's efficiency in one-shot learning. Your brain receives input attributes all the time and tries to make sense of them by searching. If inputs are recognized, fine, knowledge can be strengthened. If not, learning can be triggered. Learning begins without names. Brains don't start with vocabulary, they start with sensory coincidences. Recognition precedes labeling. Language is an overlay, not a foundation. In this demonstration, the concept of Fido existed before the word Fido was ever attached. Similarity drives structure. The graph naturally forms hierarchies based on shared attributes. When two examples share a subset of attributes, the system creates a parent concept to hold the overlap. This is abstraction. The same process by which humans learn categories like dog, animal, or living thing, and it requires no external instruction, only observation and differentiation. Negative feedback is as informative as positive feedback. The simple directive no caused the creation of new structure. The brain learns not by confirmation, but also by rejection. Every contradiction refines boundaries between concepts, just as every child learns to distinguish cats from dogs. And here's a biggie. Access is by pattern, not by name. In this demo, nodes are found through their attributes, not their labels. This mirrors human recognition. We don't retrieve dog by keyword. We retrieve it by pattern similarity. A fuzzy image, a bark, or even a sense of companionship can trigger the concept of dog. Recognition is emergent from the network, not a lookup operation. Conversely, a graph in a computer typically labels every node, allowing direct access by name. In the brain, there are no labels. This means the brain's graph is content addressable only. Every node is accessed purely by its attributes. 
Labels on nodes are unnecessary to the operation of the graph, though useful for explanation. Well, this means that a node with no attributes is inaccessible. Further, multiple nodes with identical attributes are redundant. They represent exactly the same thing. Knowledge formation is self-organizing. The hierarchical relationships weren't programmed, they emerged. When patterns overlap, the structure reorganizes itself automatically to minimize redundancy. This is how the cortex builds efficient, multi-level representations without central control or explicit logic rules. Generalization and specialization are inseparable. Every time the system differentiates one instance from another, it simultaneously strengthens the concepts that they share. This stems from the fact that you can only directly sense instances of things, not general categories. While you can comprehend the general concept of a dog, when you see one, you are always seeing a specific instance of a dog. It always has some unique characteristics, even if that uniqueness is only its position in your visual field. This is true learning structural change. In both the brain and the brain simulator 3, learning is not the storage of examples, but the modification of an internal graph. Every observation reshapes the network, strengthening some pathways, weakening others, creating new nodes when needed. Knowledge is structure, not data. The Brain Simulator 3 is a continuing development project with lots of unique functionality. One of its strengths is that it can help bring some open questions into clearer focus. In the brain, the algorithm for scoring the best match for a given set of attributes remains unclear. One might think that more matching attributes would help, but this is not necessarily better. Brown and barks can match just as well as brown has fur and barks. Conversely, observed attributes not currently in the graph are not necessarily bad. They provide new detail for learning. Also, the decision of when to learn is not obvious, which is why I put buttons in the demo. What we can say is that no match always triggers learning, and attributes present in the search but absent from the target may signal learning opportunities. This simple demonstration, leading to Fido is a dog, reveals the essential nature of learning. It's not memorization, not pattern fitting, and not statistical averaging. It is the continuous reorganization of relationships based on experience. The brain learns by forming and reshaping networks of meaning. Each yes and no adjusts the topology of understanding. Over time, the structure itself becomes the intelligence, capable of recognition, generalization, and abstraction. That, at its core, is how the brain learns and how the Brain Simulator 3 aims to replicate that process. The Future AI Society is developing software which demonstrates these and many other brain-like abilities. I hope you'll join us on this journey towards building AI that doesn't just process information, but actually understands it. If you'd like to follow along, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because the YouTube algorithm won't surface videos like this unless you ask for them. Then, try out the software and join the community for free to participate in our online video conversations and our Discord server. Check out the links below. And as always, thanks for watching.